Thank you, Maeve, and thank you everyone out there for all the issues that you've um, been bringing up through the day. I, 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 it's a privilege to be at the end. Hopefully I'll touch on a couple of things that we might have left hanging a little bit. Um, there we go. This is, this is me ages ago, um, redesigning the Year Museum in 2004. But so you can see a little bit of what I was dealing with and what it's still like on its, well, whatever days. Um, a smorgasbord of ancient artifacts, some modern reproductions, casts, yes. Um, kids art, even we had, we had kids art up uh, on the, the stop share is hiding it, but you know, on the top of the cases and um, lots of archives and other paperwork. Um, this is more of what it looks like nowadays. Um, and uh, I won't, I won't tell you, hopefully some of you have heard me talk about Annie and Percy or before, just to say, um, that they are the um, founders of the museum. And nowadays, um, both of them have their own little mini booklet, <laughs> also available online. Some that repeat each other, but Percy's was done first and then Annie's was done uh, only a couple of years ago, actually released just about the first day of lockdown, I'd say. Um, but um, the, um, it's important to reflect on them before I, um, before I start talking about um, gender and sex and such, because in fact, they, uh, it's the archives relating to the origins of the museum that gets us to one of my um, case studies for today. Um, that is um, a case study dealing with the sexing of Anglo-Saxon bones. Um, I'm actually going in the opposite direction, dare I say, of the title. So sex and queering and gendering rather than the other way around, but you get the idea. Um, a undergraduate project now on queering the Year Museum. I had a question earlier today, what's a trail? So I guess we'll have to talk about that in addition to queering. Um, and a project that a research project I've just started working on relating to gendering Athenian festivals. And um, Oh, I'm going to throw in, um, as if I'm going to talk, not talk about my colleague, Claudina romero Mayorga enough today about a project that uh, I was working on with her, mostly her, on um, Cypriot figurines that coincidentally turned out to be a bit non-binary. Um, we owe um, our, our first case study, actually, um, an osteological analysis um, project to um, some important work that my colleague Amara Thornton, um, our research officer, uh, now having heard um, this great talk about the Ashmolean, thinking that everyone should have a teaching curator. Um, and I would say in addition, everyone should have a research officer. So Amara Thornton was our research officer for a year and a half and wish we still had her, the funding and all of that. But she literally rewrote our museum's history, having trawled through the archives of the university and museum. Um, and Basically, and this is her chart, and I'm not going to explain all of it, but basically before the university had a classics department, it had stuff. And then we got a professor of classics, per Percy Yor. Um, uh, but um, there was an origin, the nucleus of an archaeological collection at University College Reading then. And um, by at least 1919, um, between Yor and Frank Stenton, um, an Anglo-Saxon expert in the history department, um, and their respective partners, um, we ended up with a museum of history and archaeology for the entire university, covering in a university sense everything, the world. Um, and then it all dissolved, possibly because of personal friction. But in any case, um, it, 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 what happened then um, is that um, the Anglo-Saxon stuff that had been excavated from a Roman and Anglo-Saxon site at the top of Lowbury Hill in Oxfordshire, and there's Lowbury Hill, um, was then moved into the history department, even though it had been excavated by the classics department. And so that's the point at which we, the Euro Museum, not that it was called it back then, lost our Anglo-Saxon stuff, lost our Roman stuff, if you see what I mean, and became the Museum of Greek Archaeology. And it was called the Museum of Greek Archaeology until 1984 when we named it for the Eurus. Um, I will not try playing that, but I would recommend you go to some of the nice videos that um, 
Amara Thornton has um, put up um, on our Curiosity web pages and such, um, where she talks poignantly. This is Annie, your my long-term predecessor, um, one of the founders of the museum. As an undergraduate student, she had cycled out from Cholsey, um, which is now in Oxfordshire, um, out to Lowbury Hill to see the excitement of these excavations that Donald Atkinson was doing. And in this barely recountable or barely audible recording we have of her speaking to the students in 1968, um, when I arrived in 2000, we had a little cassette and we digitized it. And that's what Amara based a lot of that sort of got her going on her work. So never throw out old technology. Someone might one of these days find a way to digitize it. That's the lesson. Because um, literally it was part of a huge box from the previous curator that said, old technology, throw out. And thankfully for about 20 years, no one threw it out. But anyways, um, so, um, but still, it was audible, barely audible. We got there and it was important to her. And so in digging how and why it was important, well, actually it just got her interested in archeology span in the first place. So what that she ended up spending most of her career doing Mediterranean and especially Greek archeology. span um, can we move on? This is Lowbury Hill nowadays, as you can see it from Wallingford in Oxfordshire. This is interestingly over a building development on top of a um, mesolithic site, a figure. Um, and um, there's Jane in the back and me and Emma Aston and Amara Thornton. We went out there, um, 2018, wasn't it, Jane? Um, 19, 18, 19, um, to see what it was all about. We didn't actually find the hill. Um, I have a panel at the top that's sliding off of the screen. Don't worry about that. But it's a, it, it, when you get there, it's a huge view of six or seven counties. I do not joke. It is an important site. You can see an awful lot on a clear day from up there. So now we know why they put a Romano um, uh, Celtic, uh, as they call it, or Romano British temple. We don't think it's a temple anymore up there. Um, this is on a slightly clearer day when someone had chopped the chop the weeds or whatever. Um, and this is how you can see it from um, a drone, um, more on the drone later. Um, and that's actually a bunch of us, I'm one of those people standing here. And this is where, uh, according to Annie York, there was this woman deposited in a robber trench in the wall of the temple. And this is the Anglo-Saxon burial. Oh, and in fact, the view of him, the Lowbury warlord found in the barrow, um, which was displayed in that original Museum of History and Archaeology alongside the woman found in the wall, or rather they were top to bottom. I can't remember which one was on the top. Maybe they took turns. But anyway, we had, we had the burials displayed back in 1919 at University of Reading. And since then, both because of departmental and museum and whatever changes, and more importantly, because of boundaries. Back then it was Berkshire, now it's Oxfordshire. Um, we gave, we, someone, they gave the bones back to the Oxfordshire County Council, who owns them. And they found the man who was buried with lots of really nice stuff and um, found with his phallic presentation of his sword and so on and so forth and displayed him in 2017. Um, in a slightly retro um, display of basically the Anglo-Saxons in um, Woodstock in their museum. And um, this, I think, tells you enough about it, what they're trying to relate to um, the children. Um, oh, there he is. Yeah, OK, you get the idea. Um, but back in 2019, when we went there, um, actually, this is Whitney, not Woodstock, where the Oxford County Council has all its extra stuff. Um, and we asked if we could see her bones. And we had our Indiana Jones moment, not just with the hard hats and everything and seeing all that tons and tons of stuff. Um, but, and they said, oh, we didn't know which bones you wanted. So we got both boxes out and lo and behold, they all go together. This is the skeleton of a woman who had been overlooked for a century because someone had divided her bones into two different boxes and every scholarly article project dealing with her as recently as 2013 said there's not enough formal analysis, so we can't say anything about her. 
So once some volunteer who said, I don't know anything about this, but it looks like it's all one body, put them together for us and said, oh, this is a project. There it is. Um, and so we created a project with the Southwestern Wales um, Doctoral Training Partnership. Uh, all it takes actually um, for a collaborative doctoral award, besides writing a proposal that they like, is a willing participant from a non-higher education institute. And that willing participant for me was um, Angie Bolton, who's the archeologist now at the Oxfordshire County Council, who's very willing and very helpful and very interested in this project. And then they give you the opportunity to advertise for a second supervisor who has to come from a different institution within the consortium. And um, we chose Sophie Beckett at Cranfield, who is um, a bit of a chemist, a bit of an archeologist and um, in charge of the labs at Cranfield. Um, which complements all of our skills and you know everything else we need. So that's good. And then um, that was funding for one PhD student and we got one very well qualified summer courts who just came from Edinburgh with a degree in osteology. That's a second MA and she knows everything else too. Um, but then Song Mi Yoon from South Korea actually said, oh, if I get my own funding, can I come along too? And since her interests were so different and that's the wonderful thing about this project, we thought we would appeal to and we did appeal to people interested in um, archaeology, landscape, osteology, um, archives, hidden histories, Anglo-Saxon history, feminism, deviance, museology, digital museology. It's on the last two that Song Mi is useful. So in fact, um, we've now, and we've added also Dr. Reed Smith, who's our museum studies person at University of Reading, um, who's the perfect second supervisor, could be even first supervisor for Song Me. Everyone at Reading has to have two supervisors. Um, and so she's, she's now essentially joined our project and we've got Song Me working on a interpretation strategy for the Lowbury lady. Um, we also call her Carriad, by the way, which is Welsh for love, I'm told, because she's obviously been so unloved for so long, we needed to do something about that. <laughs> and, um, but her archeological context, her museum contents, et cetera. There's an awful lot to be interpreted there actually. And it's in a beautiful site that attracts lots of people who come visit. It's right by the Ridgeway. So we've got national trail people and so on and so forth. In fact, this is our first team, um, team project. We reached out to the local community and lovely chap on the right, Hedley Horn, he's the guy who made the drone photography. Um, and we went out there in November, which is the best time to go find anything underground essentially not that we were digging underground but just to you know see where it was because otherwise it's it's rural it, it, it's too overgrown um and another team project um obviously was to finally we had to start when people weren't really able to go look at bones but finally we got the chance to go do it and so that was a couple of months ago i guess we finally got to go see the body and getting two osteologists and that's um sophie and um, Summer, Summer is the one at the back, so if you just to the left of her, or right of her. Um, that was when we had an aha moment, because I don't know how many of you know anything about osteology, but there's two basic parts of the body that you're supposed to look at to figure out sex, the biological determination of sex, the pelvis and the skull. That's about as much as I knew. And we looked at them and um, they said, mm, go either way not sure it's a woman oops the whole project devoted to this forgotten woman and then to find out that it's not a woman but and i'll just explain gender dimorphism in, in terms of the pelvis the whole idea is unsurprisingly because of the fact of making babies and everything if that angle is more than 100 100 degrees then it's probably female and our skeleton is about 90 degrees but there's some glue there. So someone has done some reconstruction surgery, shall we say, with glue that we have to now get conservator, we've got funding now to take apart so we can be sure of that. But even if it is only 90 degrees, don't worry, it's not the end of the world. You look to the skull and there's a whole bunch of things to look at um, in the skull. Um, here I look at my notes because I actually, I'm not enough of an osteologist to know all about them, but for example, the tiny bony protection behind the ear, the mastoid process is longer and wider um, in males than it is in females. 
and then the superorbital mar margin, the upper border of the eye socket um, tends to be thinner in females. On all of these, we're about half and half. So again, it could be male, could be female. And don't worry, Summer in her cheerful way said, actually, that just gives us an excuse, a good opportunity to ask for funding to do more conservation and scientific analysis so we can have the underlying chemical profile, et cetera, et cetera, better, better idea of what we're doing. So hold on to that. But then she told me something that I, in my middle years, found quite surprising. She said, for a person of her age, she's very robust and actually very feminine. And she's referring to the fact that Carriad from previous studies is, and you can just eyeball it if you're good at this kind of thing, is at least 45. So she died at least at the age of 45. Could be much older than that, I don't really know. And apparently all of us, our bodies, our bones change through our lives. So if she died when she was 25, all that pelvis stuff might have mattered. But by the time you get to 45, there's not a whole lot of difference between our pelvises. How wonderful is that? <laughs> I mean, some people might not like it, but you know, it, 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 when you think about it, women are not making babies too much at age 45. And so the body's gonna adapt. And there's other ways the body adapts to show your lived experience, not necessarily your biological determination at birth, but your lived experience, which could get a little bit closer to your gender. But that's a story for another day. And we, we, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. I'm going to turn on to um, our second case study I wanted to talk about, Queering the Year, the title of a um, trail that my colleague, Claudina Romero Mayorga, last summer created an opportunity for an undergraduate um, working uh, on the Europe program. This is Reading's Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program. They pay them quite well for a summer worth of research um, to do something working with a member of staff. And this is Claudina's first time supervising someone that she supervised many people in other capacities in the museum, obviously. And Domenica, our second year student who came along and did it, did such a good job that she got awarded the um, best uh, heritage and creativity project. And I'm proud to say that's the second year in a row that the Year Museum nabbed that project or that, that award. Um, but our trail is not out yet. Trail, our intention is to have, it's not an exhibit in terms of like, here's a showcase, look at it and go away. Though one can do that in an online world. A trail would be something that maybe we could indicate with QR codes, our original trail, Sophie the Owl, our mascot, for the under fives. Basically, you have a booklet where Sophie the Owl looks at a different pot in each case and tells you something that you may or may not care to know. And then you just move on to the next object. Maybe they all tie together. So if we did a queer trail, that would be a way of bringing people's attention to the fact that we have some objects that might be interesting and useful for people trying to understand queering in antiquity, people's responses to sexuality and antiquity, et cetera. It's a bit of a minefield, as Dominica found out. Um, there we go. This is from the Europe website um, where she's talking about her wonderful um, successes. And I'm really sorry to say that it's hiding under the, um, the transcript of my voice, but basically she said, uh, it was great working with the archives of the collection, as well as learning to balance and link my own independent research with reflective peer discussion. And that was really an important part of this project. So she came up with a script, basically. She chose nine objects, nine themes. There's one of them, I'll get back to that in a second. And an object that she thought spoke to that particular theme. And between her and me and Claudina and her peer interaction, we had a lot of going back and forth and back and forth. And finally, we were going to announce it, launch it in February in LGBTQ plus month. It hasn't happened. Partly because, well, OK, we've got the themes. These are the essential titles. They're sort of a grab bag. You could throw them back and forth. You could put them in any different order. Maybe that's a good idea. I don't, I don't really know. I'm not really to judge who is to judge. Um, but just to give you an idea, this is the script that we have at present about the Amazons. The Amazons on at least one of our pots, 
throttling and or being throttled by the Greeks. Maybe Achilles, shown at the moment that he falls in love with Pent Penthesilea, except that's also the moment that she's dying because he's killing her and so forth. And we talk about issues about, you know, have nothing to do with queer, essentially. Barbarian means people who don't speak Greek. And this is how the Greeks look at the women who might be women who are Amazons, who take on what the Greeks think of as male roles and so on and so forth. Women embodying male values was a challenge, to say the least, for the ancient Greeks. We have a particular problem here because there's things we could say about the Amazons and things this pop says. But... And I'll fast forward to, we wanted to present it to our local University of Reading LGBTQ plus community who were keen to participate. And that's why we haven't launched it yet because they had so much feedback, starting with, oh, if you're gonna talk about the Amazons, you have to talk about the Labrys, which is the double X, which has become a lesbian symbol of some significance, but we don't have a Labrys on our pop. We can't talk about the thing that isn't there, if you see what I mean. And so they, they've come with additional expectations, hopes, requirements. Would that we had Robert Zahn, we just sent him off to get us a few more pots. You know, that's a bad joke, sorry. You, you, you see what I mean, it's a, it, it, it's a conundrum. How can we say everything they want us to say and truthfully represent this object? So we have to write things in a general enough way, maybe that people with inquiring minds come to the stuff with those thoughts and go away and do a bit more research, something like that. But we have other more general issues, add pronouns, easy peasy, mm. except when you're talking about someone who transitioned. So, Kynes, Kynes, starts as a female, he, she, her, wants to be male, he, him. Would Kynes want us to talk about them with the them pronoun, with a non-binary, which pronoun do we use? Oh. We get the point, but it's, it's hard in a world of gender fluidity. And then they said, avoid the headings. If we avoid those headings that I showed you earlier, well, when you have a trail, when you have a book, you have subject titles. How do we divide it up? These are real questions. Answer them if you, if you can later. <laughs> Um, I've talked about the add more info about the Amazons. Define ancient terms. We threw in more definitions. We do that all the time because we know we're writing for average reading age of 12. I don't mean that with regard to the queer community, but that's museum text across the board. Um, and then they always said, what about this? What about this? What about this? So when we talk about Hermes, who is a liminal god, they wanted more on bisexuality. And the whole reason we were talking about Hermes was because he was a god of lim liminality and some people would do love spells where they'd invoke him so they could get their boyfriend to die or you know something like that. And, and, and they were pushing us to talk about things that actually we don't really know anything about, shall we say. Um, so more, more, more and more challenges. Oh yes, overemphasis on female victims. Right, that gets me to one of my other topics actually later, overemphasis on women. Who would have figured? Oh, here it is. Yeah, so a few years ago, again before lockdown 2018, Kathy Morgan at Oxford um, All Souls College had a conference on feasting with the Greeks um, with a couple of collaborators and asked me to speak about women feasting on pots. I do women, I do pots. Sometimes I do feasting. I say, great, okay, I can do it. And the closer and closer I got to it, the more difficult it was because, of course, the whole reason that we don't talk about women feasting on pots is because. Certainly since the French structuralists of the 1970s, they say women don't do anything to do with sacrifice. Not that, they weren't there, forget it. Mm. But then you have images of women participating in the feast. And then you have to say, oh, is she a prostitute or not or whatever. And then you have women participating in every other aspect of sacrifice. And the more I looked at these things, the more I realized that these, Slightly rubbishy looking, maybe not very well preserved little pots. And scale is completely wrong here. This pot is about that big. These pots are like that big. They're tiny little like oil, oil, oil jars. This is a big serving vessel. They call it a Fine. Um, so 
the issue of um, women participating in religious activity has been highlighted for at least the last century by these two categories of vases called Lenaia vases. And these are the Lenai, that is another word for Minads, Bacantes, Bacchae, women who worship Dionysus, at an event called the Lenaia, which is celebrated at Athens, probably in February, and elsewhere in Ionia and everything. And the sources for it are not that good, except for this good number of vases, more than 100 vases, half of which are big, fancy, red figure vases found in Etruscan tombs, and half of it, which are little vases, not just like the boy, but you know, ones like that. What do they have in common? They have the same set of events. Women going up to a statue or a figure or a altar of Dionysus and then see the Dionysus masks worshiping. And so much of the scholarship has focused on these ones, the red figure one. Why? Because they're pretty and you find them in all your museums. Why? Because they're so pretty that the Etrus Etruscans bought them and put them in their tombs. But these are the ones that you find all over Greece, like all over the place, and not just ones with the Dionysus masks, other images of women dancing, women worshiping, women sacrificing, women at the symposium. Another thing that the men tell us they didn't do, and women in chariots. And mostly we haven't worried about them because most people don't look at them because they're small. And a lot of museums don't even put them on display, but they're there. Um, and I think the one in the middle here might even be one of Suzanne's in her catalog that it's unpublished, don't worry. Um, and the one on the right, this is hard to tell. We've got lots of women and horses and chariots and maybe some men. They're so sketchy, it's really hard to tell. Anyway, so I'm writing a book on women at festivals on these pots. Um, we don't have a contract yet, but you know, we're working on it. Um, with Katerina Volioti at Roehampton, who actually did her PhD at Reading on these tiny little pots. And she's been too busy interested in actually the shaping, the making, the, the interesting style in which they're presented, that we hadn't been thinking about the, the, the images enough. And obviously no one else has either, but we'll get around to it. And finally, my fourth one, um, Cypress in 3D. This is a pre-lockdown project um, dealing with, this is an original um, Panelarga figurine from Cypress. Um, it's not dissimilar to all of the stuff coming out of roads around the turn of the century. A lot of stuff coming out of Cypress, Cypriot tombs and sanctuaries for the most part. In some cases we know which tombs and sanctuaries, but anyway, this is obviously a not very nice and 3D printed one. This is another um, variation of it. Um, I have more of them here. Um, we have nine of them actually, and we, we scanned, 3D scanned, 3D printed several of them. And lo and behold found that the audiences, young and old, preferred handling the prints, not the originals, but the prints. Handling the prints, the 3D prints, gave them an opportunity to engage with the artifact in a playful, creative way to think, what is this object? Who does it represent? Why are they holding this? What are they holding? Who gave it to whom? For what reason, etc. We don't have these answers. In fact, the excavators didn't have these answers. And we think our audiences did at least as well as the excavators um, in coming up with, you know, decent answers. One thing they wanted to do, several of them are holding musical instruments. They wanted to create a band. So we created a band and this became a little bit of a, a Twitter sensation, the voters. Um, sorry, missing their hashtag. Um, and in fact, Claudina took a musical instrument from um, the Ashmolean, from one of these figurines in the Ashmolean and put it into the hands of one of ours so that we could have a little bit more, more diversity. Um, it fits into today's talk only in so far as through all these discussions, with the exception of the warrior I showed you earlier, who some people thought was a guy, because it looked like an obvious warrior, excuse me, I'm going ahead of myself, 
let's see. Oh yeah, second one over here. Something like a shield, something like a helmet, something like a beard, fine. Otherwise, no one could tell and didn't really seem to care about the gender of these figures. But then we got to do some more of the playful stuff. Um, our wonderful volunteer, Matthew Knight, did this, um, this video with them. Well, we have a couple of different variations of it, but um, putting them inside a Cypriot sanctuary and imagine the music. And if we go back to, and I'm afraid I, 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 I heard the quote and I digested it, but someone earlier today talked about um, people who, um, who need the film of the book. That was you, Campbell. Yeah, it's a little bit like this. We give you music, but A, if we gave them song, we'd have to give you the voice and that would be giving you a gender judgment. And B, we don't know what music they play. So it would just be fake. So we might as well let you put in your mind's eye, whatever music you want, whatever dance you want, whatever the wind of you know, the Cypriot Island, whatever you want. Um, I'm, I'm coming to, a, a sort of hasty and inadequate, I suppose, conclusion here um, in showing you now one of the cases in the Year Museum where actually we do show those little cruddy black figure pots, even some broken pots on the bottom of us in Vincent case. This is one of the larger record holders, little oil dress that I showed you with women doing something festival oriented. Um, um, again, there's, there's the one, this isn't in the Year Museum actually, this is in a museum in Greece. But um, it's great. I don't, I'm not saying those are women, but so many of the other figures on these related pots are women. So what are these charioteers doing there? And could they be women? It's just, it's something that helps you, you know, think slightly uh, outside the box. But if we get back to the, um, the original study that I had actually, well, complicated though gender may be, it's just one of many frame, frames that are relevant to queer issues, as we found out. Um, other issues are power, empowerment, representation, et cetera. Things have changed an awful lot in my 20 years at the Year Museum, not just in the Year in the University of Reading, but more importantly in the world. And the Year is, like other collections that have been talked about today, and certainly the one that Maeve's going to show us later, it's a small museum filled with small things. Small is beautiful and encourages engagement with an honest, shall we say, um, on an honest, intimate level, um, small objects such as black figure Lekakoi I showed you and the Camelarga figurines from Cyprus are a snapshot of average artifacts of average people in antiquity, not the rich and famous, just stuff that people use. And in that sense, they're more important than their larger, fancier artworks that you find highlighted in specific display cases in specific museums around the world. We have to think about them alongside our other sources, of course, and present them to our audiences in a way that opens rather than closes vistas, presents them through a new frame, such as the queer frame. According to the World Health Organization, of course, sex is characterized as biologically determined, and so will await DNA analysis of Karyad's biologically determined sex. But again, according to the WHO, gender is what's socially constructed. Because of their advanced age, we cannot know how Karyad, the person now represented by our Lowbury skeleton, presented their gender. Because of their advanced age, we don't know about if they ever gave birth. But preliminary results suggest at least that they had a long and productive life. They were well-fed and strong and carried lots of stuff. Now, whether that stuff was children, food, tools, armor, building materials, perhaps we'll never know, but it is maybe a nice idea to start imagining. And I looked at some medieval manuscripts and found this is Saint, um, Athel, um, Athelberga, I believe, from Ely. But one of many, though, though this person seems to have a female name, many of them are presented in a way that isn't necessarily clear about male or female. They're presenting them in terms of their roles, whether they work the land, whether they 
worked um, in a military context, or in this case, whether they worked in a religious context. So that's enough for today. Thank you. <laughs>